let's switch gears now and start talking about this third system, the adaptive immune system. The inflammatory response that is started by the innate immune system is an amazingly effective response, but it's not perfect. Remember, none of these systems are perfect, which is why they're all intertwined with each other. The more that we can throw at an invading pathogen, the better, the more effective the immune response will be. Inflammation is not perfect. First of all, inflammation is very uncomfortable for the human or the other animal that's experiencing it. And inflammation itself damages tissue. In addition, the inflammatory response is not going to be able to kill every single bacterial cell or every single viral particle. Some microbes are going to survive the inflammatory response and continue the process of infection. The innate immune system has its limits. Remember, we said there are a lot of PRRs on our sentinel cells, and they are able to recognize hundreds of PAMPs and DAMPs, but there are some that get missed. There are some PAMPs and DAMPs that are not recognized by those sentinel cells. The innate immune system produces no memory of the interactions it has with microbes. That system is only able to respond very generically. It, it uses the same response every single time that it encounters a pathogen, even if it has encountered that pathogen before. That's why the adaptive immune system evolved. The adaptive immune response is going to complement the innate immune response. The adaptive immune response is what allows for the elimination of all microbial invaders ultimately. It is very specific. It does not further damage tissue the way inflammation does. It has memory, and again, that will allow for a prolonged protection against microbial invaders. But the adaptive immune system takes time to be activated. That's why the physical barriers and the innate immune system are so important, because they are protecting us in the time before the adaptive system becomes activated. We talked about the cells that act as sentinel cells in the innate immune system. But there are other cells involved in innate immunity that are going to be involved in specifically activating adaptive immunity. Those cells are going to be responsible for capturing some of the microbial pathogen cells and processing those cells, breaking those cells apart and holding on to pieces of those cells so that they can be presented to the cells of the adaptive immune system. It's these other specific cells of innate immunity that are gonna do a process where they present what are called antigens to activate the adaptive immune system. Now, before we talk about those specific cells and before we talk about this presentation process, let's think about what an antigen is. By definition, an antigen is simply a molecule that is capable of eliciting an immune response. So, most antigens are proteins. In fact, proteins are the best antigens, especially 
large proteins. And we have said that there are very large proteins, right? There are proteins that are made out of thousands of amino acids. When proteins have little extra pieces of material attached to them, glycoproteins and lipoproteins, those also make great antigens. Now, what about other types of macromolecules? What about carbohydrate? Well, the more complex polysaccharides make pretty good antigens. Not as good as proteins, but pretty good antigens. Simple polysaccharides like starch and glycogen, those actually make poor antigens. Now, what I mean when I call a polysaccharide simple is that it contains one type of sugar. For example, starch and glycogen, those are polysaccharides, but they are composed of only glucose, lots and lots of glucose all bound together. Because of the simplicity of those molecules, they just don't stimulate the immune system very well. Lipids are another type of molecule that are poor antigens. And it's probably because lipids don't vary tremendously between different types of cells. And finally, the nucleic acids, DNA and RNA, those are very poor antigens. And the reason is the DNA and RNA among different cell types, again, doesn't vary. It all looks the same. Now, there's another term related to this word antigen that we need to be familiar with, and that's this term epitope. All an epitope is, is a region of an antigen that the immune system is specifically recognizing. So an antigen is any molecule that can elicit an immune reaction, and an epitope is the part of the antigen that the immune system is recognizing. Remember, when we use that word antigen, antigens can come from all different places. Antigens certainly can come from outside in the environment. They can enter the body. But antigens can also come from within the body. In other words, there are some normal proteins that the immune system sometimes recognizes and responds to. Um, we refer to that sort of a reaction as autoimmunity. Um, I'm, I know you all have heard of autoimmune disease. That's sort of an immune response gone awry. There are also abnormal proteins, though, inside of our body that are sometimes produced and they act as antigens. They elicit an immune reaction so that those abnormal proteins can be destroyed. Finally, there are abnormal cells inside our body, right? Cancer cells are a good example of that. Cancer cells, regions of cancer cells, can act as antigens and stimulate an immune response. And that's good because that helps protect us from certain types of cancer. So let's think about where antigens are coming from. There are bacterial antigens, there are viral antigens. And remember, when it comes to pathogenic microbes, bacteria and viruses are the most common pathogens that human beings are getting infected with. There are certainly other types of microbes that can be pathogenic. We've talked about those, but it's the bacteria and the viruses that are the primary pathogens for humans. Now, when it comes to other types of antigens, I want us to be familiar with what we can consider non-microbial antigens. Now, I already talked about normal proteins in our bodies. Those we can call autoantigens, and those are the ones that are involved in autoimmune diseases. Diseases where 
the immune system reacts to what should be a perfectly normal protein in the body. And as a result, the person develops a disease. Now, another type of non-microbial antigen that's perfectly normal, but is not part of autoimmunity, are what we call cell surface receptors. You, for example, have certain antigens that are on the surface of your red blood cells. And those antigens are what give you your blood type. So as you are aware, if you were to receive blood from another person who had different antigens on their blood cells, you would respond badly to that blood transfusion. Your body would elicit an immune reaction and destroy those blood cells as though they were foreign pathogens. You also have cell surface receptors on your tissue, on the cells inside your tissues. We refer to these as MHCs, and I'll talk about those in detail in just another minute. But it, uh, it is the cell surface receptor type of non-microbial antigens that is the basis of all types of rejection, transfusion reactions, um, transplant rejections. Um, this, these types of cell surface receptors vary from person to person, and so they can act as antigens and elicit an immune reaction. The last type of non-microbial antigen that you might not think about at first is this. There are toxins that get produced by certain microbes that are antigenic, that can elicit an immune reaction. Think about venom, for example. There are venoms that are produced by insects and other organisms that when they get into our tissues can cause a lot of tissue destruction and can also elicit an immune reaction. There are just plain old chemicals that can act as antigens. And importantly, there are drugs that can act as antigens. There are drugs that can elicit an immune reaction. Think, for example, about penicillin. There are people who are allergic to penicillin. They, when they take penicillin, their body mounts an immune response to it. Now, the innate immune system is going to encounter pathogenic microbes and it's going to take apart some of those cells and hold on to certain pieces of those cells that are antigens, that are antigenic and able to elicit an immune response. They're going to process that antigen. There are two sentinel cells that are doing this type of work, the macrophages and the dendritic cells. So, when it comes to macrophages and dendritic cells, they have two jobs to do. They are sentinel cells, number one, and they're also antigen processing cells, very important cells in your immune system. So let's think about how antigens are processed. Remember, most antigens, the best antigens, are large foreign proteins that come into our body. What these processing cells are going to do, these macrophages and these dendritic cells, when they encounter these pathogens, is they're going to break down the cells to get to these proteins, and they're even going to break down the proteins into smaller pieces, into peptides. That's the processing part. Those small peptides will then be bound to receptors on those macrophages and those dendritic cells. These are antigen-presenting receptors. 
They're on the surface of the macrophage. They're on the surface of the dendritic cell. The antigen, that peptide, will be stuck to or bound to the receptor on the surface of the cell, and then it will be presented to the adaptive immune system cells. Now, these antigen presenting receptors, these are the major histocompatibility complex molecules. This is the MHC that I mentioned in the last cell, uh, the last slide. You may have heard of MHC. MHC again is critical in the process of rejection of transplanted organs. And that's because MHCs differ from person to person. So the receptor that is on the surface of a macrophage, on the surface of a dendritic cell, the receptor is the MHC molecule. And that little piece of antigen, that little peptide, is going to be stuck to that MHC, to that receptor. MHCs, these receptor molecules, are actually heritable. They're passed down from one generation to the next. And again, they vary from person to person. MHCs themselves, in other words, are antigenic. I know that's confusing, I know, but stay with me. Stay with me and I, I hope it will become clearer. The peptides that get attached to those MHCs, those receptors on the surface of macrophages and dendritic cells, are going to be presented to and recognized by a different type of white blood cell. The lymphocyte, remember we said lymphocytes are one of those types of white blood cells that you find in the bloodstream and elsewhere. Specifically, the type of lymphocyte that the antigens are going to be presented to are called T lymphocytes, or what we often refer to as T cells. These T cells are going to trigger the adaptive immune response.